Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Rory Reed back again for part three of our series on how to paint dark skin tones. For those of you who have not uh, been to the channel before, this is just a long series I'm doing. It's going to be a full length tutorial cut up into parts. I've already done parts one and two. This will be part three. So if you haven't checked out the previous parts, go back and look at those. Also be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. It greatly supports the channel. And let's jump right in. As we discussed before, we made our uh, gradient you see on the palette there to your lower right. Uh, from our darkest value to the lightest value and we just used burnt umber as a base for the shadow colors we used some turquoise blue ultramarine blue and a touch of black to mix in that dark shadow color you see on the far left of the palette there and then once we got up to the mid-tones we added a bit of cad orange and um, cad yellow deep hue so for the mid-tone colors it does have an orange tint and that will come in handy once the uh, painting takes shape a bit more later on as you'll see the goal now in part three is just to flesh out the skin a bit more adding more layers since now this bottom layer has dried what you're looking at at the canvas has completely dried now so we're just going to be looking to layer more brush strokes abstract left right up down diagonal on top of this base we already have and that should fill out the skin a bit more so this is sort of a rudimentary part of the painting process there's not going to be too much difference um, as far as the likeness is concerned because I'm not going to be touching the eyes, the nose or the mouth that much in this part. You'll start to see a dramatic difference in parts 4 and 5 moving forward as those are the um, parts where I try to hone in on the likeness a little bit. As I said previously, I'm not going to be uh, focusing too much on the likeness but you know the painting still will look like the reference photo but I usually if I'm doing a painting for like a commission or something I will usually spend a lot more time making sure it looks uh, the likeness looks exact so for the purposes of this um, YouTube tutorial the painting will look like the reference but not exact because I'm not going to spend any time doing it. The purpose of this again is just to show you how to get your skin tones um, on like a professional level. So now quickly referencing the photo I decided to do some work in the shadow area. If you notice when I started I was using a bigger flat brush um, and we broad strokes to block in all of our different planes and values on the face. Now for this layer that we're doing, I'm using a smaller flat brush and I'm going to layer this on top of the bigger brush strokes that we um, had laid down in the previous parts. This will serve to sort of chisel in and hone in on our sculpting process so to speak we use bigger tools to start and then once we get down to the nitty-gritty we use smaller uh, tools to detail the painting and basically what I'm, I'm doing here is just trying to match values as close as possible to the reference photo. So I have somewhat of a mid-tone here that I took from the middle of the uh, gradient that we mixed on the palette and I'm just looking for the appropriate areas on the face that would match that particular value. And 
And so I grab some of the darker value now from the left side of the palette and you can see firsthand how the palette works. If I want to bump up the value, I just mix to the right or grab values from the right side. If I want to drop down the value, I just grab values from the left side. Pretty easy. And so I'm using the bigger flat brush here to um, just block in some work in the shadow. I had decided uh, earlier as well that I'm just going to leave the shadow portion of the face somewhat abstract because um, to be honest with you, trying to detail the shadow portion of a painting is sort of a waste of time because the eye is not really gonna pick it up when you stand back like you know eight to ten feet back when you're observing the painting like when the viewer is observing the painting so trying to spend as much time as you do in the higher value portions of the painting is is a, sort of a waste of time as I said because it's gonna read the same once you step back so spending too much time detailing shadow areas as far as the subtle uh, value changes in the shadows is sort of uh, tedious so I decided that I'm just not gonna do that for this piece and in general I really don't do that anymore when I first started uh, earlier in the in my career I was doing that you know because you thought you had to render out everything on the painting but as time goes by you realize it it's much better to just make the paint or make the value changes sort of suggestive in the shadows so that it just reads well in, instead of rendering it out fully. And at this stage, we're still just guesstimating, paying a, a little bit more attention, though, to the the um, value, trying to get it as closely as possible. And once you do that, um, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's not exact or not. We're not to try and we're not trying to do like hyper realism. So as long as you get it in the general area, it'll it'll work. It'll read well. Taking some of our darkest uh, value as well, and now we're just going to work around the edges of the forehead, trying to sculpt that. Bumping up the values slightly as you see there, grabbing some paint from the middle, and trying to put those mid-tones in there just blocky brush strokes still at this stage using my thumb to clean up any edges that I might have over painted or you know and just swift firm brush strokes to get the paint on the canvas to uh, cover it up cover up the uh, the white canvas that's showing through and I'm also doing sort of um, directional brush strokes as well to indicate the pl to indicate the planes of the the uh, forehead and right there I just sprayed the canvas because at this point now since our bottom layer has fully dried and set in we can start working um, a little bit of moisture on the canvas to um, smooth things out, keep the paint a little um, wet, giving sort of a oil-like um, consistency. So when I want to, you know, um, smooth out some edges, it'll uh, it'll happen easily for me.
so yeah those are all the tools i'm using i have the palette knife for for mixing and cleaning off the uh palette it's a glass palette and i have a spray bottle so when the paint begins to dry out on the palette i'm spraying the palette and then occasionally if the paint is um drying out on the canvas itself i'll hit it with one mist of water just to keep it sort of active so it doesn't dry and set in got to be very careful though don't spray too much because then it'll start to run and that's a new nightmare just one spray is usually good two at max And this early in the painting, I'm not I'm not going to be spraying the canvas too much, just the palette to keep the paint um, wet on the the glass palette. And I had a comment in the one of the previous parts or one of the previous videos of someone saying that they're having having a trouble keeping the paint moist on the palette. That is the reason for the glass palette, guys. It's very important. You, if you don't have glass, you can probably use plastic or any other surface that does not absorb water. The acrylic paint is, um, the medium of it is uh, water. Or I forgot the word I'm looking for, but yeah, it's, it's water-based as opposed to oil paint, which is oil-based. So if you're using a surface like a wooden like a piece of wood or something that absorbs water, your paint is gonna dry out a lot faster. So it's that's the reason I use the glass palette. This is just like I had a little eight by 10 frame hanging around. So I just took the glass out of it and I used that for my palette and um, stuck a piece of paper on the bottom so that I can uh, you know, accurately judge the values and such when I mix values and tones it's just a neutral color and yeah that's it the glass doesn't necessarily absorb too many too much of the water if any and um, you know the spray bottle if it starts to dry out from the open air I just spray it and we're back to square one so the, the paint stays moist through the whole paint session. And as you can see now I've filled in uh, some of the values again in the forehead region. I'm basically putting the brush strokes down and I'm using a clean filbert brush to just blend out some of the hard brush strokes to make the uh, skin, there it is, I'm using the filibert brush here just to make it a, a little bit more smooth. I don't want to make it completely smooth because then it's going to start to look unnatural. We're just taking out some of the harsh lines, especially in those mid-tone areas. Give it just like a natural blend and that's it. Don't overdo it. And when I'm blending as well, I'm paying attention to the consistency of the paint or the viscosity of the paint. And I'm using the film brush to blend very lightly, as lightly as possible. So the brush is barely touching the canvas. And if I don't see any change, then I put a little bit more pressure and try it again. Don't just slam the brush on there and, you know, s scrub it in harshly just as you're doing the blending very very lightly and be sure to um, clean the brush in between each blending stage so that you don't muddy um, or you don't get values in different places that you don't want so if you blend it in a, a dark area on the or shadow area on the face make sure you clean off the filbert brush before you go to blend a different section that may be in a lighter value, valued area. Using some of the lighter values now to try and 
put the initial indication of our little Rembrandt triangle there on the shadow side of the face. That's just a little pocket of light that uh, shines through. Because our light source is clearly coming from the right, like top right, so I'm going to give us the little Rembrandt triangle there. And we just have the early indication of that. Once we fill out the shadow area some more, it'll be uh, more apparent. Mid-tone area work again. We're just just straight brush strokes. Diagonal one there. You know, this, this section is not, or this technique is not too complicated at this stage. We're just indicating the planes of the face through the brush stroke somewhat and mostly through the value change. And, and we're still just layering, just putting paint on top of paint. Trying to stay true to the reference as much as possible, though we're not following it exact. And he, as you can see, just doing this and then spraying the canvas when it's necessary there I hit it with two sprays to keep the paint on the canvas moist then I go in with the clean filbert brush blend out the harsh edges of the brush strokes I just made and it gives it a nice even blend across And this is how you render out or refine out the the painting from like an amateur look to a more like realistic um, look. You know what I mean? And again, we're not going to touch the eyes, nose or mouth too much for this paint session. We're I'm literally just I'm working on the surrounding areas the forehead the cheeks and you know the jawline and the chin etc once i get the, those uh, where i want it then we'll put some work in on the eyes the nose and the mouth to um, solidify our likeness and detail it out At the time that I'm recording the voiceover for this third part, I have completing, completed the, the painting. And yeah, I love how it turned out. It looks completely amazing. So by the time we get to the end, uh, I know you guys will be super impressed. I did a couple hours earlier today on Twitch for the final paint session. And then now I'm recording the voiceover for part three. But yeah, the painting is officially done. Um, I do have, let's see, I have about three, well, maybe four hours more worth of footage. So I'm deciding how to break that up. Um, maybe since, um, since there's not much technique wise that changes in this middle portion i might skip some of the middle just to cut down on the number of parts if you don't want me to do that make sure you tell me ahead of time just leave a comment below if you want me to include all the hours in one hour uploads then let me know it, it'll be about maybe six hours total i imagine six or seven hours total so let me know what you guys want to have done. And now you see from where we began till now, it's a huge improvement. Still got to do some work on the eyebrow area in on the left side in the shadow region. But again, um, the shadow portion is going to be largely unrendered and a little bit abstract just to give a nice contrast with the right side of the face uh, that I am going to detail out fully. Well, 
as full as I'm as fully as I can for this tutorial purposes. And yes, yeah, it's just basically just like a sculpture, man. It, you weave a web on the bottom foundational layers and then you just paint on top of it to fill out and pull out the different planes. You use the lighter values on the palette to the right of the gradient there to pop the plane or pull the plane up towards the viewer and you use the shadow colors to push the planes back or down into the canvas. That's sort of how I think about it while I'm painting. So we grab some of our dark value now, we're going to work um, in the shadow area a bit. As I said, using this to push down the planes and just chisel out the shape of these uh, shadow areas around the eye and the nose. And yeah, you don't have to do any wild brush strokes or anything like that. It's just, I just touch it on the canvas and do one quick drag in whatever direction I'm, I'm you know, trying to indicate. Super simple. At this stage, we just want to keep it nice and simple. Don't want to overdo it. As long as by the end we have a good solid uh, sculpture, then that's all that matters because once we start adding our detail layers, it's going to be phenomenal. Also, you'll you'll see the 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 magic of detailing the eye or the importance of detailing the eyes nose and mouth the painting is going to look kind of wonky like it does now until i hit the eyes the nose and the mouth and the lips you know when doing portraits those should be your main focal points because that's what tr sort of transforms the portrait that's what makes it look like the person you're painting. Eyes, nose, and mouth, the distance they are from each other, and, um, you know, just the proportions of your reference compared to what you have on the canvas itself. So now we grab the couple shadow colors or values and we're covering up that left eyebrow now like we mentioned before and um, bouncing around as usual to let the areas that we just just touched dry dry and set in spending the majority of time as well on the face itself as you can see the neck and the upper torso still haven't even touched that too much yet we are going to render that out a, a little bit more as well but not uh fully as so that it doesn't um compete with the face itself you know the face is going to be the main attraction everything else the background the hair um the shadow portion of the face on the left side there and the neck and the torso are just going to be our backups, backup singers. That's it. We won't, don't want them to steal the show. Mm. 
mist in the canvas again another good thing that you or another added benefit of using the spray bottle is that it allows you to see the actual um, colors that you've placed on the canvas meaning the paint on the canvas right it's acrylic so it's water-based and it too is going to dry out as the water evaporates out of the paint out of the the pigment so when you mist it with water it adds back the moisture so it looks like the paint is still wet well it doesn't look like it is wet because you just spread it but it gives you the same rich color just like you see on the palette on the canvas so it like shows you what the painting will look like after you varnish it when you're done so it's like you're painting you know with the final um, visuals if that makes sense you don't have to paint with the dull dried out colors guessing what it's going to look like after you varnish it you can actually see it while you're doing it the water acts sort of like a varnish while you're painting effect wise you know and yeah this is just my my technique man i got the idea of the water bottle from just watching other painters man it's um it's sort of a requirement if you're using acrylics in my opinion you you you, you have to have it man a good spray bottle that can mist your palette and the canvas and you'll get uh, all the nice blends you want you just have to know when to uh, mist and spray the the canvas knowing when to spray the palette is easy because you're gonna see the paint drying out just hit it with a couple sprays to get water back into the pigment and you're good to go And so from this portion or this point forward, we're using the same exact technique. As I said, when we started, there's not going to be too much going on in part three because it's just a rude, just rudimentary painting at this point. Our technique is we're matching values from the as best as possible from the reference. We're blocking those in with the smaller brush this time and we're using a clean filbert brush is like a filbert brush is like a flat brush with rounded edges for those of you who don't know what that is and we're using a clean filbert brush to blend in our blocked in brush strokes and we're just doing that over and over and over again looking at the uh, sections of the painting that need to be addressed that need more paint Locking those in, using the reference as our roadmap, judging to the best of our abilities, using our eyes, and just smoothing them out with the filbert brush slightly, making sure to clean our filbert brush uh, in between blends. So I have like a paper towel on the table that you can't really see. So every time I'm blending with the filbert brush, I'm just rubbing it out on the uh, paper towel to get any excess paint out that's still on it from the um, section I blended. It's more of a hassle than oil paints, but the benefit is, or the trade-off is, the my layers dry faster, so that, that's how I like to paint, as I said in the last video. When you see my paintings in person, they have like an added three-dimensional effect because I have so many different layers by the time I'm done on top of each other. And, you know, doing that with oil paints uh, would be a very, very long task because it's going to take at minimum one whole day for the oil paint layer to dry and that's if we if you don't use any um you know thinning agents or anything like that 
So with acrylic, I just put a layer on, go to a different section. By the time I'm done painting the other section, the original one I touched is already set in a little bit and dried, and I can just add another layer on top of that and without it, you know, meshing together or blending together. So I guess that's the the benefit is that I can control the blends um, on the on the painting as I go, as opposed to oils where I would have to wait a significant amount of time to be able to do that. So now that we've touched the um, shadow area a bit more, you can see the the skin is a, a lot more full now. It, it's starting to look like a real person, so to speak. If you look at the reference, um, there are more pinkish tones in her face. Um, but again, as I said, we're not going to do that yet. Um, because for these th first three parts of this tutorial, just want you to focus on learning this particular technique. We make our gradient, we use our gradient to make a perfect painting. When we get to the end, well, we'll add in some color harmonies and, um, you know, some subtle colors to, um, make the the portrait look more interesting if you will normally when i'm painting not for a tutorial purpose i would have already incorporated some of these colors in the face um, by now but for this it, i just want to show you that you can keep it simple and still get a beautiful uh, portrait or a beautiful painting doesn't have to be a portrait. This, this technique you can use when painting almost anything. So now I added some of that turquoise blue, touch of that ultramarine blue there, which is on the far right and a, a spot of um, black just to Great down, testing it, the value against the background color now, see it's uh, super light and decided to drop it down a bit with a little bit of that ultra marine blue and black mix there, touching it again and testing it out, decided it was good enough and we're going to indicate this lighter value on the left side here as you can see in the reference photo itself this section of the background is lighter than the um, right side a bit so as i said we're going to go for this checkerboard effect though we're not using the same color the, the doesn't matter the value is the same and we're going to get the same effect just with a different color that's another thing too you can do if you don't have any of the colors I'm using, you can use any color you want. You don't have to use the the blues. You can, you know, go greens would work well, purple would work well. Any anything like though, anything like that. Any cool color, well, I guess any color really. Just have to, tr you know, translate it well. The color scheme I'm going for is the the cool background I'm gonna have cool shadows where I'm gonna add some purples in then I'm gonna mix some lavender colors which is just basically a lighter um, purple with blues and then I'm gonna add in the pinks as well in the cheek chin lips nose areas probably even above the eyebrows and then I'm gonna hit it at the end with a some of the background color but lightened up to a highlight value range and that's basically the color scheme that I'm going to use to 
set this portrait off. But that'll happen towards the end. Right now, we're just working with this brown. And for those of you who have been paying attention, the orange tones that we put in the mid-tone area, as I mentioned before as well, the orange, tone, orange tones are really doing a good job. And if you're not a seasoned painter, you won't even recognize it. But if you are a seasoned painter, you'll see that it's giving a warmth already. So it's a, the orange is just a slight warmth it's giving. And it's working well against the uh, blue background. Because, you know, those orange and blue are uh, complementary colors. So now that was... Uh, pre-planned strategy as well. So our shadow color that we mixed on the palette is the burnt umber, the turquoise blue, and the ultramarine blue with a touch of black. That is giving the shadows a deep brown color with a cool tone. And our mid-tones and highlights that we have mixed so far um, have a warm, a warm base to it. So it's cool against warm. Cool shadows, warm midtones, and highlights. So far. Like I said, for um, parts uh, four and five, we'll be mixing up some, well, probably not for part four, but for part five, definitely we'll be mixing up the other colors we're going to drop in as i said it's going to be pinks um lighter blues uh lavender and uh purples as well as a deep uh purple for our shadow area we're just going to hit it and you can just look up any color scheme just look up um go on youtube search for like a color theory video and you can see all the different sort of color schemes you could use to, you know, to incorporate. If you're a beginner, I'd suggest just following what I do here. That's going to be easiest. But for those of you who are into... Also, for this part three, I did speed the video up about 20% or so, just to cut down on the overall time. I uh, noticed that it didn't really affect um, what you can see as far as mixing the colors go and so on and so forth. So I did that just to uh, shorten up the time um, a little bit. And now you see I added a bit more ultramarine blue and some of the turquoise blue as well. This turquoise blue color I have is a pre-mixed uh, color that I did myself. So I just used like some hookers green, ultramarine blue, some thalo blue, and I think that was it with like black to, um, you know, drop it down in value. but. That's all it is. You don't really have to um, use it. Just use whatever you have, whatever color you have. It's not going to matter that much. And yeah, this was another um, painting session. So um, I just included it in part three because we're doing pretty much the same thing uh, as we were doing in the last session. So. And usually when I stop um, painting, 
I usually try to paint in uh, three hour sessions, sometimes maybe four. And I usually do that because I want the paint to like freeze into the canvas and set in. So, because as I said, at some point when you are using the spray bottle, the painting will get saturated with water um, to a breaking point. So at some point when you're doing the spray bottle method, you got to stop and let the paint sit uh, overnight or at least, or I would say at least four hours or so and just let it lock in to the canvas and you know, then you can come back. So I usually keep my paint sessions, you know, layering and layering and layering. I usually keep that to about four hours max. And so we cleaned our palette off and, and uh, like I said, added the ultramarine blue, the black, the turquoise blue color again. Man, this is just a simple, simple palette. We got our same burnt umber mix. And the um, blues and that we have is strictly going into our shadow areas and background areas as well now so and decide to mix up some of that um, black color you can call it an ivory black it's just a generic one that comes out of the tube and that comes um, out of the bottle i have and it's more of a, on the cool side so you can call it an ivory black if you want and put that in with some of the turquoise blue and some of the ultramarine blue to get that rich deep shadow color and we're dropping that in filling out the hair area and we're not gonna render out the hair as well because like I said we only need one star of the show the hair is in the background and it's um, in shadow so no need to waste time rendering out, rendering out, rendering it out. Sorry, we're just gonna um, paint the shape, like the outer edges, somewhat, and then we're just gonna slightly indicate the points of the braids that have the light hidden in it that you can see on the right side. There, we're gonna do those slightly towards the end. We're now the like I said, once you step back, it's going to read well, so don't even worry about it. So you see, we already have the sh overall shape down. We can refine the edges a bit moving forward, just so it will read as braids. Um, but yeah, it's not, it, it's in shadow. There's not much detail that's going to show through. You'd be wasting your time if you're going in there trying to paint out all the individual braids and yeah, that's not necessary. Not necessary. And I'm also using the edge of the flat brush, as you can see there, to sort of now come into the brown skin a little bit um, because I don't want to have just a harsh edge from the skin to the hair as it currently sits you can see it looks a little strange so we want to get a nice gradient blend going back into the hair from the skin so right now we're just bringing the hair over lapping just just a hair like a millimeter over because when we go back for another layer on the skin we're gonna spray the canvas and then blend those in um, to get our shadow areas to indicate you know the shadow or the cast shadow that the hair casts on the skin so 
this is just a setup move we are seeing right now. So we're taking some of that um, color that we mixed, we lightened it up slightly and added more of the turquoise blue color. And as you can see, we got a lighter value than the value of the hair. And that's what we want. We want it slightly lighter to show that it's the background color. Overpainting there, just use my finger to take off the excess to leave the shape of the hair. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And as you can see, when I did the hair, added that layer, and then I did the background on the right side, like we just did, look at the color now. It's a lot more rich and a lot more full because now all the um, white canvas is not showing through anymore. Now you're just looking at the pure color that I mixed on the canvas with the value variations here and there that are still showing through from the bottom. It's not the white canvas showing through anymore, it's just the value changes that I've mixed throughout the lifespan of the painting so far that you're seeing and it's giving a nice, you know, collaged effect. So that when you step back and you look from it far away, it's, it reads well like a real, maybe wall or something of that nature. Adding a touch of the ultramarine blue and some more white, pulling it in slightly to gradually bump up the value. And then we're putting another layer on right in that highlighted area just to indicate the same area from the reference photo. We're going to spray it as well now and then sort of blend it in so that it's not so prominent. Once we blend it out, and we're, we're basically sort of fading it out to take off some of, the, some of the punch of the value. Hopefully you understand what I mean. Now I'm going up into the darker areas here as well and just trying to blend the outer edge of the hair into the background a bit to sort of indicate that she's in this turquoise, turquoise blue atmosphere. Then I'm using that darker shade to touch over that highlighted area I just put on to drop that down a notch as well. It's also important to pay attention to your edge work. So in the shadow area here, I keep my edges sort of blurred and out of focus. And for the right side of the face, as you can see, I have that pointed edge that I'm going to refine more as we go along. And it, it gives you a nice focal point right on the right side of that face compared to the left side that I'm also going to blur. Um, in with the hair. Doing this as well gives um, 
you know, three dimensionality also. Great way to indicate um, how the head is sitting in this space. A lot of little tricks like that, man, you, you pick up over, over the years when you paint. Your value work, your color scheme, your composition, your work with your edge work, like, like I just mentioned. All of this stuff, your brush strokes, the portion of the paintings you render out fully, as opposed to the portions that you leave slightly rendered out. All of this stuff like works together to make a great painting. Mixing up some mid-tones again to now go put some more layers on the forehead. Because even this late into the painting, I'd say we are slightly past midway at this point. Even this late, you can still see some of the white canvas popping through right there, right in the middle of the forehead. You can still see some of the white canvas showing through with that brown uh, mid-tone color on top. So we're still going to add some layers over that portion to get our true color that we mixed on the palette to show through. And it's things like that that beginners don't really um, pay attention to. So they might think their painting is, you know, ugly or they can't paint, but you probably just haven't put enough paint on the canvas yet. I don't care if you've been painting for three hours already. It's, you know, you got to look and pay attention to what's actually happening on the canvas and uh, adjust accordingly. And so now you see we're trying to um, focus a bit more and pay a little bit more attention to detail now when judging these values that we're putting on. Because we're sort of over the hump. The, we got a lot of paint on the canvas already. And so now it's time to initiate our detailing slightly we're not going to go full-fledged detailing yet but we're paying more attention as we go along it's a gradual increase in the attention to detail and that'll be apparent on the canvas as you go along you'll see the difference um, and when it starts to look like your reference you know you'll just want to keep going and going and going and whenever you put a particular value on your brush it's always good to just check other regions of the face to see where that value could work and just, you know, drop a brush stroke there. Even if it's just as a placeholder. Misted the canvas there again to keep the paint on the canvas active. And we're going to use our filbert brush and blend out the, any harsh lines that don't need to be there. Most of the times when I'm blending, I blend around the brush stroke. Meaning, if I'm using the flat brush and I make a brush stroke on, like say for example, the forehead, um, when, I, when it's time for me to blend, I blend on the outer edges of that brush stroke. I rarely ever go over the middle of the brush stroke, if, you're, if that makes sense. 
Sometimes I do, but most of the times, especially at this stage of the painting, I'm just blending out the edges around the width of the brush stroke. And you, if you notice, as time goes on, the skin is looking more and more full, more and more rich, more and more realistic. If you are going for like a full-fledged hyper-realism style um, painting, you would be paying a much more attention to detail as well in terms of um, your color mixing, right? You'd get a reference and you'd sort of color match before you even start painting and just do this technique and you'd eventually get something close to your reference. But me, I'm using basically my own color palette here. So while the likeness will, um, or the portrait will look like the reference, the color scheme sort of won't. Like there's a more pinkish brown or warm color in the reference, mine is not going to be as warm. It's going to be a more cool vibe. Same thing with the background, etc. Et you know, putting my own spin on it. Suggest you do the same when you get better. Having a reference should just be like a guide. What I'm taking from the reference is basically. Um, values and the likeness and that's it nothing I, I do my own colors I decided on the composition ahead of time you know I'm just using the reference for like the like a light map so I'm mapping where the highlights are, mapping where the shadows are, all the, all the different shapes, all the different nuances, and I'm trying to mimic that as best I can in the given amount of time. So that's what I, that's the real value of the reference. If you didn't have the reference, then you'd basically be guessing all of this stuff and if you're a beginner and that's the last thing you want to do you don't want to be guessing <laughs> as a beginner there you're gonna get lost really quickly and even at this stage even though we have um improved the skin tone and the overall fullness of the skin the painting still looks largely uh, unfinished and the reason for that is because we have not rendered out the eyes like detailed the eyes the nose or the mouth yet as i said in the upcoming parts we're going to do those and you're going to see the massive difference it makes so e even if I was not to touch the our surrounding skin anymore on the forehead or the cheeks and the chin, and I just did the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, even at this stage, it would look spectacular. But like I said, I'm going a little bit extra on the skin tone because I know that's what a lot of you are watching for. But it's just the same, it's just the same technique is just time spent at this point, right? When I started, used the bigger flat brush, blocked in all my values with nice firm brush strokes. For the subsequent painting sessions, I used a smaller flat brush and tried to map out the value changes, shadow areas as well with the smaller brush. And then uh, for like the third layer I'm putting on, I'm doing that same thing with the smaller flat brush but now I'm spraying the canvas 
and then I am using the clean filbert brush to blend out some of the straight lines and the harsh brush strokes from the flat brush using the reference as a guide. And depending on how many times you do that same process where you're just using the smaller frat brush, um, blending, you'll, you'll achieve, you know, maximum realism or rendering, if you will, the longer you do that and the, you know, more, you know, more attention to detail you pay. And so here we um, mixed up shadow color just to start doing a little bit of work in the pupil area and surrounding area of the eye. Just trying to hold that outline shape so that we don't lose it as we move forward. Again, keeping the eyes, the nose and the mouth exactly where you they're supposed to be is what's going to give you the likeness of the person you're painting. So you need to pay extra careful attention that you don't move any of those lines up, down, left or right. Wherever you initially uh, drew them or if you did the method I told you to do, which is to print out your picture and then transfer them over like with transfer paper or something that's a great way just to get the proportions and the composition for the face um, really quickly if you did that you would make sure you keep in these lines in the exact same position throughout the entire painting from start to finish it's like I said if you push one of the eyes a little a millimeter to the left or a millimeter up or down is gonna look completely off so gotta pay extra careful attention And so paying attention to the different areas of the face, there's an area that's in shadow, there's an area that's in between there, like in the mid-tone range, like the middle of the forehead, and there's an area that is in like, you know, a high uh, lighter value stage or a highlights uh, portion, which is like the right side of the, out of the face. And so if you look at the palette that we've mixed, the three colors on the, or the three values on the left side of the gradient, you can basically stick to those for any shadow area of the face. Like the left side of the forehead, left side of the cheek, left side of the nose, neck area, you can even do it into the torso area as well, to be honest with you, because um, don't really want to have any lighter values competing with the face. I know it's uh, like that in the picture. Like you can see some of the values on the neck and the chest area are similar or close to the right side of the face. But for me, I'm not going to um, bring those values that close when I'm painting. That's just an artistic decision that I'm I'm making so because I don't want to I don't want to have it competing you know I don't want them to look at the face and then the neck and then the chest so just stay on the face man and that's the star of the show as we mentioned so yeah the three on the left in the palette gradient that we mix 
we do those we use those primarily to work in the shadow areas the three highlighted or lighter values on the on the gradient that we mixed we use those to work on the light side of the face and that's just the general concept of how the palette works quick and easy when you take the time to pre-mix this then you know you can just grab them and go you don't have to sit there mixing mixing all day long when I first began using acrylics that's what I did and man did it take forever because the paint as I said quickly dries out and so you a lot of times you end up having to remix paint all day long this way just works better in this glass palette mix out your gradient get the spray bottle and just spray the the glass palette um, as you go along ever so often throughout the painting we're still just working a bit on the eye and just refining it with a small I think this is a pointed round brush I used just any small brush and yeah on, on uh, Instagram I got a couple questions about brushes these brushes I'm using are just cheap brushes I got from Michaels they have like um, a pack of brushes that I believe it cost me like five bucks and they came in a whole bunch of different sizes and yeah these are just cheap brushes man I don't I don't have any brushes that are expensive at all there's really no need for super expensive brushes I mean if you can afford it and you you know like to use them there's of course nothing wrong with it but for those of you who think that the brush is gonna make a significant difference no you can still make it work with whatever you have I'm using these cheap five dollar brushes that I got in a bulk pay was like a 24 pack of different brush brushes and I barely take care of them when they um, mess up or break I just go back to Michaels and buy another 24 pack for five bucks it's, you know that's the beauty of the cheap brush you don't have to spend time like worrying about cleaning and taking care of them none or anything like that I just rinse them out in water put them back on my uh, work desk and I'm good to go for the next paint session so yeah we have made significant strides from where we began in the beginning of part three if you click back on the timeline you'll see the jump in uh, our rendering process and right now yeah like I said we're just working on defining out the surrounding areas of these eyelids just trying to get the values more accurate to the reference See, we got the value on the right eye lid much closer than we currently have the left one. Haven't done any too much work on the left one yet, but that's what we're about to do now. And that's sort of what I'm paying attention to is the value. Is this color lighter or darker than the reference? And how does it compare to the other areas of the painting I've already painted? It's just a constant checking back and forth. It's also good too if when you're painting you um, step back every so often to um, see how your painting is reading overall and see if there are any glaring mistakes, things of that nature. When I paint, at this point I sort of record everything I paint most of the time. So if you can see on the right side of the screen there I have OBS up that's the program I use to um, stream and record so in OBS it gives me a preview so 
a lot of the times I don't have to get up and step back and I can just look at the OBS preview and it'll give me a, a long range distanced view of the overall painting so that's like a little trick I use as well so that I can constantly you know look at how the painting is reading overall from a long ways away and so I don't have to manually get up and step back away from the painting myself Putting a few marks in on the uh, nose as well, trying to define those lines out. Um, we still haven't touched the nostrils too much yet, so we're going to be looking to do a bit of work on those as well. But, you know, looking at the portrait, um, the areas that need work you can see are very apparent. Still need work in the middle of the forehead, still need work on the left eye, brow, lid, left cheek area, just to smooth those out a bit. And then the neck and upper torso area needs to be rendered out a little bit more. As I said, we're not going to do it as rendered out as we're going to do the face, but we want it to still look presentable. And then once we get done with um, this portion, which as I said is we're just going to try to get the skin tones to a nice place like the overall skin, the forehead, cheeks, chin. Once we get those to a nice place, then we focus on rendering out our eyes nose and then lips putting all the different um you know creases and crevices in the lips and the different value changes there for the eyes we're of course gonna make the pupil spherical by putting in our proper shadows and such right now it's just a flat you know white color and a flat blue color in the middle area so we're going to render those out fully to give our th give it the you know the three dimensional pupil look. To same thing with the nose. Define those planes a bit more too. And once we do that, then you'll see a striking difference between what we have now and it'll look a lot more like the uh, reference photo we have or we're, that we're working from. And what I'm doing here is just trying to get some of those shadow areas mapped out. We're not really going for the exact value yet. We're just, like I said, taking an educational guess. And so, yeah, we're winding down now on part three. This has been a good session. We're going to let this dry and set in so that we can come back again and uh, for part four and start a bit more work on the actual features eyes nose etc and the like so thank you guys for watching uh, check out my teespring store if you're interested in any merch we got logo tees and all different goodies on there link in the description and also follow me on all social media all my links are down below and if you're interested in any prints or originals, I have a store linked below as well. Like and subscribe to the channel, guys, and I'll catch you next time for part four. Peace.